Uh, so hello, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll be discussing the importance of including disability voices in COVID outreach efforts and showcase some of the resources uh, that we've been working on, including educational materials tailored for rural communities and people with disabilities. Um, but really, and some strategies for navigating vaccine hesitancy. Well, we also really want to hear from you all. We know that you are the experts in your communities. Uh, so we're here to learn from, from you all what's been working, what hasn't, how we best we can support your efforts. Um, but before we dive in too much, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Andrew. I've worked at the Rural Institute at the University of Montana for 11 years. And we work to improve the lives of rural people with disabilities through research, training, and service. My work is primarily focused on transportation, housing, and geography. But COVID-19 has certainly taken uh, much of my attention over the last few years, as I'm sure it has for many of you. Um, so now I'll have, I'll let Jeff and Jason introduce themselves. Jeff, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, my name is Jeff Gutierrez. I'm the Knowledge Translation Coordinator at the Research and Training Center here at the Rural Institute. So basically that means my job is to enhance the dissemination of research, improve partnerships, and find new ways to get the word out, and which is how I got involved in the Hub. I've only been at the RTC for uh, about nine months, so still a lot to learn and look forward to working with all of you. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, my name is Jason Jones, and I am uh, about as far away as you can get from Montana. I'm in Kentucky, in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. I work for the University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute as a program coordinator there. Um, and uh, I'm here today just to talk a little bit about my own story and the journey through the, through the COVID process. And um, looking forward to uh, spending some time with you all. Thank you, Jeff and Jason. So we're going to uh, move right into uh, uh, a poll. So now that we've discussed a little bit about who, who we are, we'd like to learn about a little bit about what types of organizations you all represent. Great. So we we have actually have quite a bit of uh, disability representation here today. So uh, we have five of you all. So you're from a disability organization. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, three from a local health department. Uh, one from a healthcare provider organization. And three of you all said something else. So thank you uh, and welcome. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and let Jason uh, dive in and uh, discuss his, uh, his story. So this, this picture makes me look really old. So uh, I, I, will, I will divulge that the, today is my 48th birthday. So it just, it just tells you how much I like working with Jeff and Andrew uh, to give up a little bit of my, uh, my birthday time to get on here and talk with you all. But the, the subject is so important. Um, and uh, we, we did a similar thing several weeks ago. And uh, thank you all for your happy birthdays. I appreciate it. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself before we get into that, I'm, as I said, 48 years old today. I've been married uh, to my wife, Jessica, for about uh, 15 years now. We have two sons, uh, Micah, who is turning 14 next month, and Bryce, who is turning 11 in three days. Um, and the reason why I want to talk a little bit about my family is just to talk about the impact um, that COVID had not just on me, but on us as a, as a unit. Um, and the, the fear that kind of came along with um, the pandemic and that kind of thing. And I think it's really important to note because people with disabilities can be marginalized in um, these kinds of things. Um, we see it in natural disasters and we see it in homelessness and we see it in a lot of areas where um, someone with a disability sort of gets pushed to the side for the idea that let's save who we can. Um, and that was a very scary uh, proposition for me and, and for my entire family. 
Um, so when COVID first started, um, we heard that, you know, mostly it was for the older people to worry about, right? Our, our elderly population of 70 or worse. Um, and, and I think probably some of that was some of the issues that were created because the idea was that these people have had a good run, right? So if it's only hurting our people that are the oldest in our, in our country, then we don't have to worry about it as much. Um, and that was very scary to me as someone with a significant disability. I was um, hurt in a, in a um, sporting accident in high school 32 years ago now. So most of my life has been spent as a C4 quadriplegic. Um, and, uh, and so when these things come about and something we've never really dealt with, with before, it was really scary, not just for me, but for my family as well. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk in the early going about um, the triage, right? Like what happens if we have, you know, we meet capacity in our institutions and of, of healthcare and we have to start making decisions on who gets treated and who doesn't, or who gets the hospital bed or who doesn't, or who gets the ventilator. Um, and we saw situations where people with disabilities were almost pushed to the side because of the idea, again, that we need to save the people that are the most savable. I mean, when we start categorizing people as savable and not savable, that's a pretty scary world to live in, right? Especially if you're one of the ones who is on that marginal side of things. Um, there's also a lot of fear, you know, of just dying, right? In the first place, all of us sort of had that fear of, wow, what's this gonna be like? But then you go one, step further than just the idea of dying, but then we heard a lot about dying alone, right? And when I go to the hospital, I've been lucky enough over the last 30 years to only need a hospital stays about three or four times, but I always take somebody with me, right? And I always, it's usually my wife or a trusted attendant or something like that. And the idea that I would have to go to the hospital all alone was probably more scary than dying, right? Because of the fear of it, you just don't get the good care or the, be the best care that you would if you had somebody that really knew what was going on with you and kind of how to take care of you. So, um, and so there was a bit of inequity um, in just access to the healthcare and then in that triage um, in that tri triage process as well. So that created a lot of fear in its own. And, you know, we talk a lot about quality of life. Um, the quality of life matters to everybody, no matter whether you have a disability or if you're elderly or you're in your early 20s and perfectly healthy. So um, it's sad when you talk about triaging quality of life, right? And people making the determination that I have a less chance at a good quality of life than someone else, because it's very subjective, okay? Um, so, and the other side of the things were, um, you know, the isolation of being home. I'm a very active person. I like to get out and I get to do things in the world. And it really, again, affects the quality of life when you're not able to engage in those kinds of things out in the public, it makes it, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it makes it difficult to, to maintain that good quality of life and to do the activities with your family and to get your, your, you know, get to see your kids play sports and do all their activities and it's sort of the, what I call the meat of, of being a father and of being um, in a family. Um, so those things went away as well. Um, and then it, when it came down to where we finally had some treatments, then you had to start worrying about everyone else's personal health choices, right? Whether or not they were vaccinated or whether or not they would be willing to wear a mask and whether or not they would be just defiant, right? Because they had a completely different side of the opinion. And then when it became politicized very early, it was really scary because it became not just an issue of, I don't want to participate, but it became an issue of people digging their heels in and anger, right? On both sides. Um, and that's something, in all of these situations, the word that comes to mind is control. Because none of those things I had control over once I stepped one foot out of my house, right? So that was really, really um, a scary proposition, um, not being able to control. All I could control was whether I was vaccinated, whether I wore a mask, and my family, and once it went further than that, it, it was out of my hands, which created a lot of issues too. And again, there was always the impact on on services um, and social activities and again, quality of life. So it's just a little bit about our story here. Uh, we were lucky enough not to get COVID. My oldest son had it and uh, actually said he enjoyed the isolation because uh, he got to play video games for three days. Uh, but uh, 
other than that, we're, we've, we've managed to steer clear of it so far. So that's just a little bit of my story and now turn it a little bit, I'll turn it back over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you for a really great introduction. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, they really highlights the importance of including uh, the voices of people with disabilities, their families, and, and all of this work. Um, so now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some research findings and really highlight the intersection of disability and rural. Um, you know, many people with disabilities are at higher risk for severe cases of COVID. Um, because as a population, uh, tend to be older, report higher rates of chronic disease, and many also live in, you know, congregate, quote, care facilities. Um, unfortunately, we don't know what the mortality rate in the U.S. is because data collection has been uh, non-existent and for collective disability status. But in England, uh, they report that it's about one and a half higher odds of mortality for folks with disabilities compared to without. Uh, so that kind of highlights some of the risks that come with that. With, with that. Um, and then living in a rural area also compounds that risk because there's less access to healthcare services. Um, there's higher rates of poverty, low rates of health insurance, higher rates of disability, poor health, and often an older population. Um, and some uh, a research from earlier this year showed that the seven day mortality rate was actually double in rural versus urban as far as COVID. Um, so I also want to share just a couple quick graphs. Um, so overall, this, this graph shows kind of responses to the question, how much do people trust a source about COVID information, ranging from one to five, with five being higher trust. Um, and it, it shows different colored bars. Uh, blue is sort of the most urban, that's metro. Micro is an orange, that's kind of like, that's, er, that's rural. Um, and then the most rural is in, is in gray. And here, uh, the x-axis, there's also different sources like service providers, local agencies, federal agencies, local news and national news. Um, and what it shows is that by and large, those in the most rural places reported overall the least amount of trust. So rural folks are, you know, don't trust a lot of a lot of sources, a lot of expert sources when it comes to COVID information, um, which, as you all probably can can understand, that's kind of that's a barrier to doing public health outreach. Um, Rural folks are also less likely to take preventative action. This is another bar graph showing CDC preventative actions like hand washing, avoiding crowds, social distancing, and wearing a mask. And we have the same kind of three categories of uh, rurality, uh, with those being the, the most rural and gray reporting the, the least likely to do any of these. Um, so again, talking a bit about how rural, rural folks are less trusting and less likely to take any kind of preventative action. But really what I wanna to get to here is that even among a, a subsample that reported some amount of hesitancy, 65% uh, of folks said that more information about the safety of vaccines would influence them or encourage them to consider vaccination, which, which is actually pretty considerable. And I want to highlight that these are all people with disabilities. This is not the general population. So this is really targeting kind of the population that we're talking about. Um, below that, there's 42% who said required for work or travel, 38% said a cash incentive, 21% if they knew someone who was vaccinated, 20% if it was recommended by a healthcare provider, 16% said if they had to visit an at-risk person, and then lower down in the five and 6% if they had time off to get vaccinated or transportation. Um, so just a few kind of strategies that we've seen that uh, can help encourage people to consider vaccination. Uh, that brings us here today. Uh, so we received a grant, uh, we wrote a one year grant, which began last October. And we have three kind of primary tasks with that, which is to curate community informed outreach materials, uh, develop strategies for addressing hesitancy, and share and distribute those uh, resources. Excuse me, just take a drink of water real quick. 
and it's really broken up into two parts. So where their first part was kind of working with a rural disability stakeholder group, uh, and then facilitating outreach via community leaders, regional partners, i.e. all you who are in, in attendance today. Um, so the first part, we convened a rural disability work group with nine disability leaders from rural communities across Montana, South Dakota, Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. Um, and our, uh, quickly, you know, we learned what was going on on the ground in these rural communities and why vaccination rates remain stubbornly low, even among uh, many people with disabilities. Um, and many of the leaders that we spoke with had exhausted a lot of kind of the common strategies for getting shots in arms. So those were things like, you know, mass vaccination events, mobile vaccination clinics, uh, free transportation, really working hard to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to, to get vaccinated. Um, and so when we first met, uh, there was this feeling that everyone who wanted to get vaccinated already was, which kind of led to some feelings of frustration fatigue and really a lack of community support. Um, and in rural areas where community support is absolutely essential to getting anything done, people tend to focus on what has traction. And so in this way, uh, vaccination hesitancy can give way to, to uh, conversation hesitancy. You know, COVID is a non-starter in a lot of rural areas throughout our region. So it's really hard to commit time and effort to an issue that isn't seen as important to a certain community. Um, so we worked with our rural disability leaders to kind of help unpack that a little bit. Um, and we quickly decided that simply being able to have a conversation about COVID and about vaccinations was really where we were starting. Uh, so we worked to develop some rural practice guidelines. Uh, so it's, so, you know, in messaging, they talked about having really plain language, be brief and to the point. You know, you don't need a whole essay about what's going on uh, in, in, in vaccines um, and really being able to have specific actual items uh, that folks can act on. Uh, we also heard a lot about personal choice and control, really trying to avoid telling people what to do and figure pointing, avoiding absolutes, because as you all have probably noticed, a lot of the, you know, best available science has changed. Uh, and, and recommendations have changed with that. Uh, and really the, the idea there is to inform and educate so that people can make a choice about their health. Uh, there's also some discussion about universalizing health, health guidance and practices, try to normalize some of the health behaviors, uh, use positive messaging and images, um, you know, images of like a vaccine needle, you know, may not be, <laughs> Uh, the best way to go about it, rather, it might be, you know, positive images of family getting back together uh, and really trying to reduce emphasis on COVID as this emergency thing and trying to kind of focus on uh, some of the, the, tangent, the other sort of aspects of the impacts of COVID, like health like, uh, healthcare shortages or uh, labor shortages, things like that. Um, and also really emphasizing local voices and values. You know, we learned that really avoiding any reference to government was something we had to be careful about. Um, and that was something that a lot of, you know, outreach materials that we found often reference CDC. So that was an interesting shift. Uh, also really making sure that we're understanding the local and regional context. For example, uh, telling people to avoid crowds in a really rural area may not quite resonate in that area. Um, and using community events as opportunities, because we know that COVID is a non-starter. So, you know, a mass vaccination clinic may not necessarily attract the, 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 the people you're trying to reach. Whereas if you show up at maybe an existing farmer's market or some other event, uh, it was really the, a, might, a better in, entry into the community. Uh, so those are some of the, the tips we learned from our, from our, from our um, folks. Um, Jason has a question, suggestions on how to include health departments or logos. Uh, you know, I think that is a really good point. Um, you know, I think that if you work with uh, a local center and if you get buy-in from them, uh, they can put their own logo on it. 
and say, hey, th this is information that we've seen, that we've vetted, that we trust. And if you're a local organization who has trust and cachet in your community, you know, I think you're free, free, free feel free to add your logo to any materials that we share here today. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff. And Jeff, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let you take over. Sure thing, thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much. Andrew's kind of presented where we stand and how we got to where we are. One of the things that we, discovered in the course of doing the hub work. I found a just an NPR article on something called deep canvassing. And essentially the idea is that researchers found that people are more persuaded by information presented as a narrative. I'm a sociologist by training, uh, looking at subcultures and conflict theory and spent about a decade doing outreach all over Montana, which is a lot of rural areas. And what they were saying kind of resonated with me a whole lot. The idea is that arguments are intended to persuade, which then threatens people's self-identity. So the walls go up, whereas stories are a little bit less threatening, the make it more, more interpersonal. And so these two researchers, Brookman and Kala, did a very thorough study on this, and they found that it's very, very effective to go about it this way. It doesn't have to be your own story. You can have a story bank within your organization. They found it was effective over the phone. They found that it can work in interpersonal conversations as well, so beyond canvassing. What is deep canvassing? It is an evidence-based technique. As researchers, that's, those are the words that we always look for in order to determine validity. Evidence-based, this is based on research. And the idea is that instead of the usual 30-second canvassing pitch where you just try to get someone as a snapshot, you actually speak with each other and understand where the other person is coming from. The way that they describe it, there's basically, there's four steps to deep canvassing. The interviewer, the canvasser, asks the community member about their opinion on a topic. And the interviewer listens non judgmentally and seems interested in what's being said. They then ask the community member if they know somebody who is affected by the topic or if they can relate to the story. And then the interviewer or canvasser has an opportunity to share their story. It's fairly simple, <laughs> and the idea is to make it more personal rather than political. But what's impressive is in this research, they found that a 10 minute deep canvas could change someone's view on an out group, because we're looking at prejudice here, could change their views for up to three months. Even more impressive, in doing their research, they found that more than 75% of the people that participated in these canvassing conversations stayed for the entire time. So a stranger comes to your door, you have a 10 minute conversation with them and share things about yourself. It, it counts for a lot. And it's based on these two strategies, narrative persuasion and high quality listening, which are both fairly established in the psychology literature. Narrative persuasion is the effect that stories have on us. And high quality listening is essentially just showing that you care about what's being said. And what it does is it decreases the threat to someone's self-image, and it helps them avoid resisting persuasion, keep those walls from going up. So what we came up with is move from deep canvassing to deep conversations, because we're not canvassing, but we want to talk with people. Andrew has covered a lot of the problems here um, that we experienced in our hub. COVID fatigue, partisan politics, people don't want to talk about these things. In our hub meetings, our participants ended up defining success as just being able to have a conversation about it. This came about based on their hesitance, not, not to get vaccinated, but to talk about it. Because in their rural areas, their thought was it could threaten their position as a trusted entity. People would see them as being heavy handed, complicit with government mandates, or a variety of black and white arguments that really we're trying to avoid. So what we thought of is, well, let's have the right conversation in the right way to try to get to the heart of this. It's using the tools from deep canvassing to have an interpersonal conversation. And looking further beyond, right now it's COVID, 
but this isn't going to be the last topic that people don't want to talk about. This isn't going to be the last thing that those in rural areas are hesitant to address. So we need to find a way to have more informational conversations. And this is what we came up with. So a deep conversation, I, I like to use the joke that I think it used to be called a conversation. It's sharing personal experiences while non-judgmentally listening to the views expressed. Fairly simple, but very challenging also. And so to practice it, we developed a facilitated interactive training with specific activities on how to share your story, what sort of, sort of story, how to present it, as well as non-judgmental communication, which is an exercise in, uh, in giving grace when people say something that's designed to be hurtful or offensive, and figuring out how to still have a productive conversation about it. And we designed this with peer groups in mind also figured it'd be easier for people to be able to share their own experiences and learn together. So that's something that has come out of our hub work. And we are doing some facilitated exercises on this, if anybody wants to learn more. We also put together outreach materials, which Andrew has already alluded to. And we did try to curate those specifically for the populations that we're looking for rural disability focus, as well as direct support professionals. And I'm gonna take you to a different spot now. So here is our hub webpage, and this contains our resource library of curated materials. In the section for rural people with disabilities, those of you at disability organizations will probably recognize plain language materials that are accessible, they get the information to people, and then they have them talk with a trusted entity, their doctor, their local health department, rather than just using CDC language. For direct support professionals, what we have are videos, which really dovetails well with stories. These are people sharing their stories, their perspective on how they made their decision to get vaccinated, which is powerful stuff. And it's coming directly from people who are involved. And then we have some design for rural communities, which follows a lot of the rules that we were talking about, uh, that Andrew was talking about. We avoid talking about the government. We try to recognize people's concerns and put them in a place where they can make their decision just like they want to. But so with that, I, I would like to uh, quickly kind of go back to our web page and sort of give you a quick tour of that. Jeff did already a little bit. Um, so this is our COVID hub web page. Um, and then here we have lots of tailored materials, all for kind of the three different groups we're talking about. Um, but it's all focused on rural. So we have you know, tailored materials for rural people with disabilities, a lot of it in uh, quick one pagers or plain language. We have some large print. Uh, so, you know, questions about COVID vaccines answered. Um, we have a couple of uh, promotional videos that we put together from our partners. Um, as Jeff said, we also have some videos directed toward rural direct support professionals. Some of this talks about how, you know, DS, some of the DSPs did have, you know, had vaccine hesitancy, but how they went through the decision making process to get the vaccine and what that looked like for them. Uh, we also have lots of uh, materials for rural community members in general, but this can also equally apply to um, folks with disabilities or other community members who might be uh, close to people with disabilities, like friends, families, or whatever, and what have you. Um, and it's all really comes from the rural practice guidelines that we talked about with uh, our rural disability leaders. Um, so please definitely take a look at all of these. They're you know free, they're here, they're available. If you want to add your own you know logos to that or other contact information, please do so. They are here for people to use. Um, if you want us, to print them and send them and mail them to you. We can do that. We have the money to do that. Um, we also have some tips for how to have conversations 
Uh, we, there's a couple free uh, communication courses here. Um, and, you know, reach out to us. We are here as a resource. Um, yeah, and Tracy says, if you have any other materials that you found useful that you would think would be a great addition to this, please let us know. Um, our contact here, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat here. Um, so yeah, and I'm gonna send it back over to Tracy. I think she has a closing comment. Yes, hi, thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, just for a wrap up, thanks everyone for your time real quickly. Um, thanks for participating and thank you to Peter from NATO for collaborating with us to host this event. Um, we hope you can use the resources that have been curated and made available on our website. And we do encourage you to contact us with any questions. Um, if you could, please take a minute after we end this meeting to complete the wrap-up survey that will pop up in your browser window. Um, we appreciate all of your feedback, and we really look forward to sharing the archived materials with you in the coming weeks, and we hope that you can share them with others in your network um, that you find useful. Um, and with that, I just wanted to say thanks again.